said, along with Russia and China. So the way here and the ratio is going to be very much, you know, not in, 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 in the perfect equation, if I may say, uh, due to other countries apart from Russia and the United States. How far do you think these talks will affect these countries that are not, you know, the front line? Yes, they're not in the front line, but uh, it's, it's also, uh, like, it's affecting the, the talks pretty much. Mm -hmm. And um, even the Egyptian situation, it's, it's trying to be as yes, as much as possible, because mm -hmm. kind of they're trying to support the Saudi Arabia uh, mm -hmm. refusal of Bashar al-Assad. And still, they can't interfere that much in the mm, internal affairs. Of yes, course, yes, exactly. Absolutely. So they're trying to be uh, as biased as as possible. Uh, the struggle between Saudi Arabia and Iran is going further more uh, recently. Mm -hmm. After also what happened between uh, Iran and Saudi Arabia, mm -hmm. of course, and the uh, ambassadors there in both countries. Mm -hmm. So we will see. We should wait and see. Yes, I'm speaking of Iran as well, because Iran seems to be reflecting very positively uh, uh, after the lifting of the sanctions by the U.S. and the U.N. And we move to Egypt independent, and then we read an article about uh, um, deals and warm words flow as the Iranian president, Hassan Rouhani, visited, uh, visits Europe. Uh, he's, he's visiting Italy. He's going to also be visiting France. And um, Italy and Iran have signed billions of dollars of business deals on Monday at the start of uh, the tour of by Iranian President Hassan Rouhani, um, which is aimed at refusing his nation's ties with the West uh, after the economic sanctions. We are talking about um, a very strong delegation that is heading to Europe, 120 delegations. Uh, they, have, they come with a lot of resolution, especially as the world is facing a lot of struggle regarding the decreasing uh, fuel oils and petrol uh, as well worldwide. So it seems to be that the lifting of the sanctions... Uh, uh, against Iran after they've reached to a, a deal regarding their nuclear uh, program is going to give an economic boost and shift to Iran somewhere else than maybe no one else have um, thought it would happen this far. Again, I'm talking here about the effect uh, the effect this would have on the Middle East uh, region, particularly countries who are very much against Iranian policies. So we have to differentiate here the economic aspect from the political aspect. Definitely they're both interrelated. But yes. how do you see the visit of uh, the Iranian president to Europe as a first step? Well, um, the oil issue and the economic uh, struggle between the countries takes us back to the political one. I kind of disagree with you. Uh, it's it's all about the political struggle. Is all about the economic one. Mm. Even what's happening in Libya, what's happening in Syria, what's happening all over the Middle East. It's all also uh, struggling over uh, Iran and Turkey, Turkey, and U.S. and Russia. And it's all linked directly have direct relation to the oil in the whole mm -hmm. uh, area. Mm -hmm. So, but the signing of the deals between uh, Iran and uh, Italy, then he's going to be going to France as well. What kind of message would that give uh, to the countries that were not in favor very much of Iran being, you know, expanding in its powers and in economic role? Yeah, they should just consider that it's it's taking us to a whole new level. Mm -hmm. It's trying to prove a new power and economic power, which, gonna, which is going to affect uh, directly what's happening. So, uh, yes, this is a huge step, and uh, we should be concerned about it because it's going to definitely affect what's happening in the, mm -hmm. in the area. Yes, let's move to the World Bulletin, go internationally now, and uh, we uh, speak on an article uh, of Israel which approves 153 new settler homes in the West Bank. Um, Israel's defense ministry has approved to plan uh, in building 153 new settler homes uh, in the West Bank, and uh, Haggit of France said uh, that the plans were adopted last week and that it involves small settlements in uh, uh, various areas in the North and West Bank area. 
And uh, according to the NGO, the move marks the end of an um, informal construction freeze in the Palestinian territory that had lasted for 18 months. Um, the settlements are expanding, and, they, and, and, and it has become a true fact and a reality on the ground that it has, is to, still more further by time become difficult to sort of control the uh, dramatic expand of the Israeli population uh, so that if you want to talk again about any peace deal, it would be very difficult to actually point out where you want to uh, places like the Palestinians have been scattered all around. And, and, and it's really sad because by time, you know, we're, we're, they might not even be existing there, which is an unfortunate truth. Um, I'm not going to talk about the role of the UN, but let me talk about the role of the Arab League, because that is what concerns us as the Arab world. Where is the Arab League from all that? And if it does hold any meeting, apart from, uh, you know, signing out declarations, what other concrete moves can the Arab League do? Sadly, what's happening now in Palestine is what uh, Israel have been planning for it since ages now. And um, what's happening, what we were just discussing now, it just taking the Arab League away from what's happening in Palestine mm -hmm. and the new updates there. And also, um, unfortunately, Israel is trying to use everything to uh, gain more time. Time, yes. And they're claiming also that uh, child children are, are holding knives against uh, Israeli army, and uh, and by that they have the right to kill them. So they're trying to do everything to do their achievements during this period. Because everybody is just busy about what's happening now. With their own internal affairs. Yeah. That it seems to be that nobody's focusing anymore on the peace mm -hmm. process as uh, it was a priority, an Arab goal. So it was mainly the only mm -hmm. thing happening all over the Middle East. The only war or struggle or whatever we can call it. That was just Palestine. Now we have Syria, we have Palestine, we have Libya, we have... A lot of other files. Yeah, yeah. But exactly. even even before that, nothing much was been done. You know, that doesn't Sadly, nothing. I think yes. seems to stop Israel from, you know, going on and carrying out its True its that. plans. Yeah. Finally, we have an article with Al Ahram online again, and uh, Tunisia police protest over pay in new test for the government. Um, several thousands of Tunisian police marched to protest to the presidential palace. Uh, on Monday to demand more pay in the latest pressure on the Prime Minister Habib Said's government after a week of riots over the jobless. There was a curfew that has been imposed on Tunisia. It was lifted, a, uh, cut short to two hours, two hours I believe, yes. uh, starting from today. As they said that the situation seems to be under control. While the government uh, refuses to admit that they have a really uh, serious issue, um, they say it's more of a stable situation. Um, but it's a bit triggering because uh, Tunisia, uh, a lot of political changes have happened. Uh, I don't know where exactly is the default, but uh, for people who have decided, just along other countries like Egypt, um, to wait for 30 years before you know, actually standing up for themselves and their rights and saying enough is enough, um, they don't expect that things would go definitely the way they want in a very short period of time with all these mm. restorations they that needs to be taken. So w how do you see the situation in Tunisia? W where do you think this is going to be heading? Um, I think uh, Tunisia is, is a lucky country. Uh, the funny part is here in Egypt we're always uh, comparing what's happening here to Tunisia which is not unfortunately correct because um, even the protesters, uh, they admit that they had political achievements and they had political gains and they're protesting for just economic demands. And this is actually really, really objective from them. They're admitting the good part and bad part about it. So. Um, with the government dealing with that, they have to be really, really careful about it. Because when it starts like that, if they, they didn't find 
the needed response from the mm -hmm. government, the demands uh, are going to be higher and higher. Mm -hmm. So they have to deal with it as mm -hmm. economic demands. Yeah, but I mean, as a, as a journalist and, um, you know, roaming around and, you know, trying to experience what's happening in reality on the ground face to face, uh, and as a, a young generation I'm speaking to you as well, uh, don't you think that people are misusing their freedom? I mean, when you, you are free to choose whatever you want and ask for your right, does this give you the right to go and destroy, to vandalize, to riot? to break down and burn down public properties and private properties like a little baby just because your demands are not being met instantly. I mean, when you speak about the government knowing how to cleverly deal with this, don't you think that there are red lines that individuals should know that this is the barrier and that they should stop there out of their own self-respect? Yes, of course. I'm totally against any chaos and any violence. It's not about violence. When it, when it first started in Tunisia and even in Egypt, it was, um, I don't know what to call it, but it was really, really peaceful uh, demands and peaceful protesters. Um, but you can't just control it. You can't control everyone. And there is, oh yes, you can call it mis misuse, of the protesters, and there's some uh, sometimes violence instead of just sticking to the peaceful uh, protests. Uh, but I don't know how they they should deal with that. Mm -hmm. It's their job. Mm -hmm. It's the government job to deal with that and just differentiate between uh, the peaceful demands and the violence. Mm -hmm and deal with violence as violence. Mm -hmm. So uh, finally, before we end our episode, how uh, far do you think uh, the situation could uh, be uh, getting out of control in Tunisia? And how far do you think if it's true or not? Because there have been a lot of analysts speaking about how this could be related or affecting Egypt, although it's logically speaking, each country has its own nature and each country is an individual country and each country deals with this internal affairs differently. But what is your take on that as a journalist? I agree with you, it's, it's totally different. The situation here is totally different from Tunisia. And here we're facing a difficult stage. Yesterday, for example, there was no one in the streets. So, uh, no, it's, it's really different. Because it was cold. Uh, yeah, maybe and because yes. it was raining as well. Yes. <laughs> yes, I wanted to shop yesterday, but I couldn't because it was cold. <laughs> yes. But maybe also they were uh, trying to uh, be away as much as possible mm -hmm. from the calls from Muslim Brotherhood mm -hmm. to go and protest because uh, we're done with them. So Egypt is different. Mm -hmm. uh, Tunisia now, I, I guess it's it's under control because even. Um, they shortened the curfew and this give, give a sign that no, it's under control. Because yeah. if it wasn't like that, they shouldn't shorten the... Yes, yes. But of course, you know, we live in a world where you never expect what's going to happen <laughs> yeah, up exactly. next. So, exactly. yeah, May I say to journalists, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you thank for your you. insight and uh, for your fruitful information. Thank you for thank joining you us. For me. And uh, that brings us to the end of our episode of The World Today. And uh, do stay tuned for more coming up on Nal International. And we'll also be joining you in future episodes as we bring the latest updates and the developments in the um, crucial files that the Middle East still remains to witness. I'm Yasmin Bakir signing off.